Hello, I'm Rebecca, the founder of Trio, and welcome to Pet Talks with Trio. Trio is the leading solution for workplaces to support their people during every life transition from starting a family to retiring and every life event in between. On Pet Talks with Trio, we chat to our expert partners for advice on how to best navigate these common, complex and often messy life stages that happen during our working career. Keep listening as we connect the dots between life and work with the simple aim of education and empowerment. After all, life happens at work. Today on Pep Talks with Trio, we're speaking with Naila van der Smissen, founder of Wonder. We're going to be discussing how to create an organisational culture that is generative, supportive and inclusive, whilst also successful. Plus, we'll be discussing how to contribute to this new paradigm of business that is innovative, profitable and has the best interest of the employee at heart. Neela, thank you for joining us. Please tell us the story behind Wonder. Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I want to tell you a lean story, but I'm not really a super lean storyteller. So I'm going to try and do my best. Um, I think the well, of course, nothing just happens overnight. And this is something that's been in the making for a long time. But it all started about 10 years ago. I think um, the first experience that I had of sitting in a circle and realizing that my life would never be the same again. And I remember sitting in a circle and sharing with people that I had met that day at a retreat that I randomly had signed up for. This could be a very long story. I'm trying to make it short. And um, all the time in the world. (laughs) (laughs) And um, just having this moment of, wow, this is what's possible. This is the connection that's possible and available to us. And I remember just bursting into, out into tears and crying for a week after it. And it changed my life because I thought this is, I need to learn how to do this. I want to have connection like this in my life all the time. And it just set me on this completely different trajectory. It was my life before that moment and my life after that moment. And so for the last 10 years, I have been learning how to create spaces um, for people to show up and be fully themselves. And first that started as creating spaces for people, for individuals, um, helping them through life transitions, just creating safe spaces for people to come and connect and share from the heart, um, offering places for people to come and listen, to learn to listen to people um, without judgment, um, without analyzing, without needing to fix anybody. Um, And slowly that led into leading spaces for organizations, for organizational change, um, to create culture. And probably now, four years ago, um, I was offered a role at Snapchat to lead this practice for them that we um, at Snap called Council for Asia PAC and um, the MENA region. So what that meant was we started creating this initiative, this big global program where people had access to um, something we called council. It's a circle practice. And every team in the organization had access to this. And for me in hindsight, so I was there for four years and this was what created a truly extraordinary culture in our company. Mm. It meant that people had the opportunity to show up to work and show their full selves, to not have to hide parts of their personality, just through having these slow, like small moments of connection, either weekly or bi-weekly, or sometimes even only monthly, where within their team or within specific cross-functional groups, people would have the opportunity to be together for an hour um, and really be themselves. And so it meant that um, people could sit together, share from the heart, share stories, and I can tell you more about how we do it, um, and really get to know each other. So this is what created this foundation of a culture of kindness and creativity. Um, I can explain why that happens too. But it was really life-changing to witness the power of this really simple practice of circle within an organization, um, if we can share from the heart. So then um, after that, I decided that that's what I wanted to do um, and give more organizations access to this. And just because it's so simple, 
it's a really simple practice that has such a huge impact and really creates a space where people can come to work and they don't feel so delineated. So they don't have this thing of, oh, I'm a person outside of work. And then when I go to work, I have to put on this persona or this mask and be this other person. And then my real life starts when, as soon as I close my laptop or I go home, you know, and it shouldn't be like that. Like, what if we could all just show up to work and love what we do and be fully ourselves and be truly connected to the people that we work with? Yeah. Oh my God. I cannot tell you how much I love this. You know, we say all the time, life happens at work. We talk to organizations and you hear organizations all the time saying, we want you to bring your whole self to work. And then when it comes to showing up as your whole self, because, you know, something's happened in life and that that life event or life transition is now messy. It's like, oh, how long? Just, you know, kind of go away over there, take some time out, do a bit of self-care and come back when you're ready, because we actually only want the whole self that is professional. Right. But, you know, now, you know, and now more than ever, work and life are intrinsically linked. You know, it's, mm. we, you know, work, we work at home and home is in work. It's, you know, we're never going to have that clear delineation anymore. But that does mean that organizations have to be prepared to change. And if you're going to say, ask your people and create a safe space. Well, first of all, if you're going to ask them to bring their whole self to work, they need a safe space to bring that whole self to work and you know we talk all the time about that means that not just culture but leaders you know need to be informed educated and supported and trained and how do we emulate that culture and how does that culture filter down so that the employee who might be having one of these life transitions or wants to show up as their self in whatever that looks like does feel one that it's safe and that, that they trust that it's okay to do so so I would love to hear about how you do that, because when you first started your story, I was I was thinking, well, how, how can you create, like, that feels scary for somebody to sort of show up in a circle environment and how do organizations create that space where it's actually okay to show up in your rawness in, you know, this is happening to me but within a work environment, I can understand over here that we can do that. I mean, that takes something to create an organizational culture that actually is fully accepting Mm. of that. So how do you do that? Sure. Uh, Good news. It's really quite simple. (laughs) that's That's the first myth we can bust is that I think people have this barrier towards like, what if we suddenly, you know, it's almost like we're afraid to offer psychological safety because what may happen and that then becomes a reason to not do it. But actually I have been doing this for years and I can tell you that nothing happens. People just show up as themselves and we are all human beings and we know how to behave in adult situations Mm -hmm. so it's not like suddenly when you open up the space and you say hey I want you to bring your full self to work it doesn't mean that everyone's just going to come and fall apart you know (laughs) and I think I don't know why people think that this is so complex I'm like no we're all adults here (laughs) (laughs) you know and of course occasionally you will have someone share a story that's really moving and there may be tears you know wonderful But this is not a requirement or like a, um, I don't know, a cost of entry or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, It's it's really simple to create a safe space. So for a leader, and I won't tell you exactly how to do it because this would be a longer conversation, but you would basically um, just set a few ground rules through the conversation. And in a circle practice, whether it happens online, it's perfectly possible doing this online or whether you do it in person, you just have a few key intentions. So we call that creating a safe container for the conversation. So you say there's a few intentions to this conversation. The first one is that, you know, typically there is a facilitator. So um, say in, in this case, that would be me. Um, And I hold this container. So I will come in and share. These are the, you know, the guiding intentions of this conversation that we're going to have. And it's a safe space. And the first intention would be that only one person shares at a time. 
And that creates this non-hierarchical structure. So normally imagine yourself sitting around the fire because this is where this practice comes from. It is old as we are. And we have it in our bones. We remember what it is like to share it like this. Mm -hmm. And that's why for many people, the first time they experience it, they have an experience like I did. Because they remember what it's like to be heard with no one interrupting them and sharing a story. So the first intention is one person speaks at a time and we all listen from the heart. So we invite people to learn to remember what it's like to listen again. Because often at work, we will say 99% of the time at work, when people share something, we get ready to respond. Mm -hmm. So we're not fully listening. We're not allowing whatever they're sharing to land in our bodies fully because we're preparing for what we're going to say in response or we're analyzing the person or judging the person. So we set this intention of listen fully with your full presence to what everyone says, no interruptions. So one person speaks at a time and you go in a certain order. You know, when you're in circle, you go one by one around the circle and everybody shares based on the prompt that the facilitator um, shares. And this can be anything. You know, usually we start with a check-in because we would like to know what is alive for people that are there. And that's a simple, how are you? Like, what's alive for you outside of work? What's happening in your life? What chapter are you in? Mm -hmm. What are you bringing today? And then- We lost so much now. It's so simple. It's honestly like- you could all you know, go away and do this even, now. Yeah, we're not even connecting in an office anymore. So you know, <laughs> there's really no opportunity to even have those ad hoc check-ins where you might see somebody in the cafe and just say, hey, how are you doing? Yeah. But you can see how beneficial this facilitated environment is where somebody can knows that it's safe. They can actually go, well, actually, this is what's happening for me. You yeah, know, and, and in a normal working environment in this sort of remote hybrid world, we very rarely get a chance to check in with our people or with each other and say, hey, what's happening for you? Totally. And, you know, and what I think is also this like weird an- another myth busting thing, people have this fear or I think we fear that once people start sharing what's really up for them, that that like disrupts the environment or something, or that doesn't fit in with what we need them to do. But like, imagine, or in my experience, what happens is, so someone will share honestly what's up for them in their lives. And they're going through something big, like they may be going through a divorce or they may be, you know, pregnant or something may be happening to them that is a major life transition that we would not know if we didn't ask. You know, and of course, this that's what this person's carrying. Yes. So it makes no sense that we don't know. Because also what it does is the person shares and it gives everyone in the room or on the screen the opportunity to lean into their leadership mm-hmm. and to lean into their empathy and to become um, a support to that person. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, now we all have to support this person. Not everyone is going to do that. But we all know. And so the way that we view their work is different from that moment onwards, mm. you know, and as human beings, that's how it should be. Yeah. We never always in the same season, everybody goes through things and yeah. the team should be an organic, an organism that works and it bends and it helps where people need help, you know, and, and it's, no one's immune to life, right? Right. All of this stuff happens to all of us at any one time. We, we're not all going through the same phase at the same time. Correct. And so it's something that I call it the self-regulation of the circle. You don't, as a leader, have to do anything. Mm. The people in the circle create whatever is needed in the moment. Mm. And uh, not every circle. So this sounds like we're doing group therapy. It really isn't. Right. Sometimes we do like most of the time we'll do circles and people will share funny stories, happy stories, you know, celebrations. And it's that and everyone leaves and they're elated, mm-hmm. you know, and occasionally it's it's heavier or the, the, the topics heavier because people have stuff going on, but people don't leave with that happiness. Mm-hmm. It is like they leave feeling seen and heard and something's been lifted. 
it's like the elephant disappeared, became a yeah. mouse. You know, it was always there. We could feel it, but we now we what it was. It. We didn't know what it was, and now yeah. we shared it. And it's no longer, it's no longer putting us down. It's no, there's the heaviness is gone. Yeah. And, and how so, empowering for that person was able to open that door and just let people know well, that this is where I'm at. And to feel that, you know, we're in this together. I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm not, not judged. And now I can kind of breathe freely. And with this weight lifted off my shoulder, at least within the workplace that I don't have to hide anymore. Right. You're not hiding. You're not pretending. That costs a lot of energy. Mm. And also, I think we're sometimes surprised um, with the humanity of other people. Mm. Like once you've shared a story about what's really alive for you, people will come and like have your back. Yeah. You know? And that creates safety in a team and it creates trust in a team and it creates connection. Yeah. And it's really simple. It's just people, people are not suddenly going to bake cakes for you. Well, maybe hopefully they will, <laughs> but they will check in, you know, like bake cakes for me any time of the week. <laughs> send me all the flowers. Um, but what does happen is people start checking in, you know, and there's something really wonderful, just knowing that people care and how you show up to work is different. So, yeah. and that's a really simple thing that you see as a leader, you are not doing anything. No, you're letting your people be the leaders. Yeah. And so as a leader, then would you, um, you know, it's safe for them to show up, you know, because I think sometimes as leaders, you know, you, you know, you kind of have to lead, right. And it's like, you know, and I might help everyone else along, but, oh, but I don't want them to know that this is going on for me because that would make me look weak or, you know, like actually what you're saying is, yeah, everyone, it's an equalizer and yes. everyone shows up. 100%. And in my experience, and I have done more than 2,000 of these in my life, so I've had quite some experience. <laughs> um, in my experience. Um, Don't try this at home. Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, you, just, you need the world to do this. <laughs> you need the world to do it well <laughs> no, anyway like try it at home by all means it's the the foundations are pretty simple yeah. but the experience comes with doing it um a lot of course so there is something to be said about that um but i would say the groups that i've worked with over a long period of time that have had the most you know extraordinary results are completely transformed as a team it become it's easier to cross the threshold if the leader of the team models the behavior of openness and vulnerability. Yeah. And typically, say if you were a leader and you wanted to work with me, I would have a session with you and we would have a circle and I would model it to you. And then you would feel safe and then we would bring it to the team. Um, because there's always this initial, you know, like who's going to take the first step? And to have a good model of like just openness. And it doesn't mean you have to come to the first session and like share your entire soul with, you know, but it's just, you know, be honest about what's alive for you. And that could be a really positive thing that we never do. Yeah. You know? So can you give me an example and obviously without names or anything like that, but what's the ripple effect? You know, we, it, it, Trey, we always talk about the ripple effect. You know, if we can help an employee through a period, a life transition at work, then that ripple effect goes out to like the family and the community, the other employees, the team, you know, there's always a ripple effect and it always stems for us. As you know, it stems from human connection. If we can create, you know, focus on human connection, you know, empower people through human connection, then, it is a beautiful ripple effect which is exactly what you're creating with the within these circles of councils so when um you've got managers or leaders you know sort of showing up and people are showing up what is this effect that it ripples out across the team and into the organization what does that look like what's the impact on culture you know what are the positive outcomes that you're seeing over a period of time because you know sure i imagine there is a, there is an immediate release and there is an immediate benefit but when you consistently embed this within a culture how how does that look like you know you spoke about creativity and it's a, you know there's a positive outcomes what does that look like because you know, every business would be crazy not to have these, you know, seek these positive outcomes. Sure. So, you know, what, what are those ripple effects? 
Um, so many. Again, we talk about this until the cows come home. Um, but one of them would be, um, first of all, people become good listeners. So they practice the skill of listening and they practice the skill of um, listening to other people before talking. So for, can you only imagine what this means in a client, like a client facing situation? And this is a small example, but learning from sales teams, working with lots of sales teams, really seeing and, and getting the feedback like, wow, I never understood how I was showing up with clients, but I was showing up with my deck ready to talk, you know? <laughs> yeah. And that's what we do when we sell something. We're like, we're nervous. We go in, we're like, blah, 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 blah. And we have no idea what's happening for that person that we're talking to. It makes no sense. And so this, this skill of learning how to connect with someone on a human level first is something that people take out. I've heard from so many people that have had access to this at Snapchat or in other places that it's completely changed the way they communicate and connect with people. So they take it into their lives. They take it into their dinner table in the evening. They take it to their children. They become better listeners and therefore better partners, but they become better people out in the world because they know how to listen properly to people. So in a, in a sales situation, imagine you take the first five minutes of every conversation you have with someone you don't know by creating a human connection first and listening to them and then basing your story on, so you're weaving both of them together. You're creating a connection. It's a completely different conversation. Yeah. Um, that's one. Um, the other thing is, and this is some like neuroscience weird um, stuff, but I love, love. Yeah, um, me too. Is, <laughs> <laughs> is that in these spaces, and they're an hour long, mind you. So this is not a huge commitment. It's like, say you do this for an hour every month or every three weeks or every two weeks, however often you want to do it. You get people together and for one hour, they're not in the same headspace as they were the rest of the day. You give them a moment to pause and we give them, uh, we say crossing the threshold. So we build this container, we take them in and they actually, through the practice of listening and being in their bodies, they put themselves in a parasympathetic state again. So you're in a state of rest rather than being like, duh, 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 I have a million windows open. My brain is like just this one small part of my brain's functioning. So first of all, they cross over and they come into a place of resting, a place where they're listening, where their whole body is present and alive. So they're present. Um, and then the next thing that happens, and this is the beauty of storytelling, and once we've checked in with people, we ask them to tell a story. And the story is just a memory of an experience you've had in your life. And it can be anything. It could be, it depends on what was shared in the check-in. So we're creative with that. But it could be as simple as tell a story about a tradition you have in your family, about one thing that you do, you know. And People start telling this, you know, this memory that they have. Okay, there was this one time we had a celebration, this happened, blah, blah, blah. And when you start telling a story as the listener, because you're not preparing to respond, you're fully listening, your brain then starts opening into this imaginary capacity because you have to imagine, use your creative side of your brain to picture yourself in the shoes of this person. Yeah, within the story that they're telling. Right. So you start picturing, oh my God, it looked like this. The colors, there was a smell of maybe, I don't know, cookies or whatever the food is they're eating and your sensory capacity and your imaginary capacity opens up in your brain mm -hmm. and you start picturing it. And then the next thing that will happen, and this is like the magic, because uh, it is a magical practice in, for me and I'm sure for everyone that experiences it. Every story that is told has an entry point that is different for every listener. So you may start telling a story and say, there was this one time in my family where we went on a trip to Italy mm -hmm. and already you've got some people that have been to Italy and they're in, you know, they, yeah. they are back in their trip in Italy, which they have emotions around and they're like, oh my God, I was in Italy too. And pff, here's all my memories and my, you know, feeling around that trip. 
or it could be, and there was this crazy uncle we had that came. You're like, I have a crazy uncle. <laughs> and so for everybody, the entry point of the story is different. And you don't know as the storyteller what it is, but that's how you create all these connections because people find out they have commonalities with you. And that's where you find out that you're all similar, the same, not that mm. different. And, and that is what creates empathy. So then yeah. you have empathy for the person because the story can go way beyond that. Like the story of the trip to Italy can become this complete disaster or it could be something really awesome. Yeah, I don't know. They got engaged. They met somebody. Um, they had a party, whatever. And you go into the story and you have the empathy for that person that you did not have before. So the trust in the team is created in that way. But also the people that have been in that session walk away with a completely different brain, ERG or whatever that's called, EC, yeah. I don't know. Um, anyway, they walk away and suddenly they have a completely different way at looking at the thing at work. Yeah. And also you've immediately created connection, right? You've, you, you know, that inclusion, whereas before you might not have had that feeling of, you know, we, I'm the same, or there's that, you know, that, that sort of connection previously, but now suddenly you've created this connection between two people, you Completely. know, that's like, actually we are, you know, we are the same. Yes. So it, driving that inclusive culture and that sense of belonging, it, you can straight away see how valuable this is. Yes. And the other piece, I think we often forget with the whole um, inclusion um, piece is that the inclusion happens automatically mm. because you ask people to share a story and they shared a story from the perspective of their lives. And so they share parts of their lives to us that we would normally never see that to them are completely normal. And to us, maybe something completely new, like, yeah. I said a story about a tradition looks entirely different to someone who is Indian than someone yeah. who is Australian, you know? And so having the, the, the opportunity of having a window into their lives and realizing that actually it's, an, we all have crazy uncles mm -hmm. and, you know, our, th there's all these, this commonality plus the added benefit of understanding some of um, traditions that are different than ours and creating connection and wealth um, of experience in that way within the team so it's kind of like the inclusions implied uh, yeah. without you know trying trying too hard yeah <laughs> yeah like without sort of forcing it it's just it almost yeah. creates itself yeah and how powerful because you know we talk to clients all the time about you know we want to create this safe inclusive environment and it's you know well actually what you could just do is get people into a safe environment containerize it and get them to talk and, and you know and I have worked with you Neela so I do know what this environment is like and they are life-changing having that safe space to show up um is really empowering so I you know I know firsthand um how this makes you feel um and it's really clear to see how that does infiltrate and you sort of mentioned earlier it isn't actually just the infiltration and the ripple effect within the business but you're then going to take that home and so it's you know this blend of you know life meeting work and actually this is a benefit that clearly impacts the workplace positively but actually then you're learning these skills you know that you can take home and just your first example of listening I mean how powerful is that if we actually started really listening to those around us and what they really are saying without being so busy that we're like okay I know what you're saying I'm just going to answer it already and I'm not actually listening at all to what you're saying because I've already answered it the moment you opened your mouth but now we're learning skills which are incredible both with them friends family partners kids like you know we can then distill all of these learnings and the ripple effect is incredible it's just yeah it's so, so simple, simple. <laughs> so simple <laughs> oh Neela I have loved talking to you I think we should leave it there because actually the answer is so simple um we're going to put your details 
in the comments below. So if there are organizations or individuals that do want to work with you um, and explore what this simple but truly effective and magical process is, they can come and connect with you directly. Um, I have loved our conversation. It is such valuable, in, such valuable insights into creating cultures of care, connection and compassion. Um, I really hope that organisations do take this up. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Speak to you soon. Bye. Thank you for listening. To find out more about how Trio can support your people, visit trio.com.